The reading is from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Let us be attentive. At that time, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief collector and rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not, on account of the crowd, because he was of small stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded any one, of, one of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Oh, young Jew who proclaim the good news of the gospel. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I mean, good morning, everyone. Kalimeritus. Being of my physical stature, since I was a teenager, every time I walked in the room, people stared. Who's that tall, skinny kid that walked in the room? How tall is he? Does he play basketball? Is he any good? That was always the first thing that crossed through people's minds. Carried on through college, and then when I got to seminary, it was even a greater novelty. How many seminarians at six foot nine do you see walking around in a black robe and can reach up to take the oil burning candle from on top of the royal gates and change it without having to bring in the step stool? I'll tell you, there's been one. He's your parish priest. Everywhere that I went, people are always looking because of that physical stature, and immediately that's how they identify me. It didn't stop at seminary. Try walking around in a black suit with a collar at six foot nine. You get a lot of stares. The only time that you get more stares is when you're walking around at six foot nine with a collar on and you're holding hands with one of your sons. You get a lot of stares there, too. The world's always looked at me and identified me by virtue of my height. And to be perfectly honest, I probably identified myself that way as well. I'm a tall guy. I liked it. I still do. It was even better when I was about 20. When I was 20, it was great. It opened up a lot of doors, helped me in athletics. I can remember my oldest brother for my 21st birthday bought me a classic muscle car, 79 Pontiac Trans Am. I was just like Burt Reynolds. <laughs> and I had to unbolt the seat tracks, and I had to move the seat tracks back so that my driver's seat was pushed all the way against the back seat, and I used to brag about it. Hey, did you see what I had to do? You want to know why? It's because I'm six foot nine. <laughs> now, I think about doing that, and the only thing that crosses through my mind is that might void the warranty. You get a little bit older, and you start looking at things a little bit differently. All of a sudden, being six foot nine isn't as great as it was when I was 20. It means I can't unbolt the seat tracks and move them back. It means things hurt a lot more now than they used to. They hurt more now than if I was five foot nine. There's never been a time in my life that I wanted to be a short guy. And then I had a little bit of a tipping point where I thought maybe it wouldn't have been so bad. It was several years ago, I was with one of my kids, and someone said, hey, do you want to be as tall as your dad? And I thought that he would say, absolutely, I want to play in the NBA. But very quickly, he sneered and he said, no. <laughs> the person said, what do you mean? He said, no, it's terrible. My dad has to ice his knees every night. He stretches all the time. He doesn't fit into any cars that he likes. And it's hard for him to find clothes. I thought, wow, out of the mouths of babes. And it got me to start to think, but then the real tipping point takes place when I listen to today's gospel reading. At the surface level, 
my old self, my old self of wanting to be the tall guy and understanding myself that way seems to work quite well because the short guy in today's gospel reading is a bad guy. Zacchaeus, he's a tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. And as you've heard me say before, especially those in Bible study, if you think that the IRS are bad guys now, they were even worse 2,000 years ago. He was a bad guy. Short man's complex, bad guy, 100% through. Makes me feel pretty good. Hey, I'm not like him. But then if I continue to read through and listen to today's gospel reading, all of a sudden I figure out, wait a minute, I need to start acting like short little Zacchaeus. Because Zacchaeus has the formula down. Zacchaeus has it figured out and he follows through and executes. It's the first time I ever wanted to be like a little guy. I want to be like Zacchaeus. And I would be more than willing to give up several inches to do so. You see, Zacchaeus was a bad guy, but he makes a choice. He makes a choice that he wants something better for himself. He wants to ultimately get into heaven. And so he hears that Jesus is passing by, and what does he do? He's not able to see Christ, because he's a little guy, and there's a big crowd around. So he says, I'm going to put some effort into it. I'm going to find something that's going to help me be able to engage Christ. And he climbs up that sycamore tree. And so he takes a first step in engagement of God. He makes the effort and he puts in the work to climb the tree just so that he can see Christ. The second step in his formula that he had figured out is that once he put in an effort to engage God, then God said, now I'm going to engage you. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there because I need to enter into your house. And so he does. He comes down out of the tree and he welcomes Jesus into his house. Now, in terms of culture 2,000 years ago, if some person entered into another person's house, it meant that they were joined together somehow. They were somehow of common yoke. They had connectivity with one another. You wouldn't go into someone's house if you wanted nothing to do with them. And so he engages Christ, and then he is willing to receive the engagement of Christ. He comes down and he welcomes him into the house. Step two. And then very quickly, proactively on his own initiative, he enters into step three. Jesus didn't walk into the house and say to him, hey Zacchaeus, you've been a bad guy. He didn't walk in and say, hey Zacchaeus, I don't like the way that you've been handling your job. I think you need to change. Zacchaeus knew what he needed to do. And proactively, he tells Christ, whatever I've done, I'm going to make up for. Anyone who I've defrauded, I'm going to restore it fourfold. He begins his process of repentance, of changing the things in his life that are not lined up with Christ. And Jesus' response is exactly what he wanted to hear. Jesus' response is exactly the same thing that I want to hear in my life. He says, today salvation has come to this house. He tells him, you stay on this track. You live your life this way and you're going to get into heaven. I want to be like that short guy Zacchaeus. And if anyone here has concern for your soul, you should want to be like Zacchaeus as well. Now we've taken the first step, those of us that are here inside of the church today, we've climbed the sycamore tree. We came to church. You see, for you and for me, that tree is St. Basil's. It's the experience. It is the place that you and I come. We make the effort to climb up. We make the effort to leave our homes, get into our cars, and drive to church so that we can be here to engage God. You and I, we've made the first step today in the Zacchaean formula of salvation. But we have to also take that second step 
Now that you and I have come here, Jesus is going to be engaging us during this divine liturgy, as He does in every divine liturgy. We get to receive Jesus Christ in our ear when we faithfully hear the epistle and the gospel readings, and then we get to receive Jesus Christ once again when He engages us by making Himself available to us in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Are we receiving Christ faithfully into our home, into our heart, into our mind, into our bodies? And then we have to follow the third step. We have to repent. After engaging God and then receiving the engagement of God inside of His house, we then have to be willing to take a good, hard, honest look at ourselves the same way that Zacchaeus did, and we have to be willing to change. Whatever's going on in our lives right now that is not copacetic with Christ, that does not line up with the teachings of Jesus Christ and His Gospel, we have to start changing those things. Don't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow might not come and you don't want to have that gap hanging there. Start to change. Repent. And if you and I follow that threefold formula, then I trust that we'll hear the same words that Zacchaeus did. That salvation will come to us. And we'll get into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we've taken the first step. Hopefully we're in process of taking the second step. And I pray that we'll have enough courage to take the third step every day of our lives so that we can follow in the footsteps of Zacchaeus as puny as they may be, but as substantive as they are. Zacchaeus is our shepherd this morning. Let us follow in his footsteps and one day rejoice in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. I'm in a rapid fire. I've got a few announcements, but we're going to be quick. First, I want to thank everybody who traveled up to Tulsa last weekend to participate in our Metropolis basketball tournament. It was a phenomenal experience by all accounts. I want to thank first and foremost Christina Masick for making it happen. She was in charge. She took it by the bull by the horns from several months ago and made sure that we had a smooth experience together with our coaches or other chaperones with Deacon John who went as our clergy representative and our kids who played. And our senior boys made it all the way to the championship. I'm not going to say any more. They made it to the championship. Next topic. On top of that, I want to share with you that as much as our youth ministries continue to grow, we have a young adult ministry as well that's been growing over the last year, meeting regularly. Tomorrow evening, we're going to have a Zoom gathering with our young adults. If you don't have that information, please reach out to either Evan Diamanteros, who's leading our, youth, our young adult ministry, or reach out to the church office tomorrow so that you can get the login credentials so that you can participate with us tomorrow evening. Topic number three. Topic number three, our consecration. As you know, we've spoken about it here inside of the church. We had a great mailing that went out in terms of email just this last week and shared a lot of details about the consecration experience. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience for a community. It's spiritually edifying for us if we approach it the right way. And at St. Basil's, we're approaching it the right way. One thing that I would like to highlight Educationally, intellectually, we're approaching it correctly. And we're teaching what it means. And we're doing so in part with a three-part lecture series that will take place here the last Thursday of each month, January, February, and March. The first one is this Thursday at 6.30 inside of the community hall where I'll offer a first lecture about the consecration experience. I've been asked if we're going to stream this. We are not. We are not. This is in-house, and I hope that as many as possible will show up here to the church. We can be together 
and we can learn about these steps on this beautiful experience of consecration. So the first lecture this Thursday, 6.30 p.m. We also had information going out about the different liturgical and outside non-liturgical events that will be taking place across the consecration weekend. I'm so, so pleased that we have so many varied offerings that are going to be taking place. Of course, the Vespers on Friday, the 28th, and the relics arriving here. And then afterwards, we're going to have a free meal for everyone who comes. We want to be able to offer that hospitality to anyone who comes onto our holy campus to pray with us that evening, to have that fellowship with the complimentary meal being offered by your spiritual family. It's going to be catered because I don't want our own people to be buried in the kitchen without being able to come in here and pray. So we're having it catered, and everyone I look forward to being able to sit down at the table and break bread and share that fellowship. The next day, of course, is the actual consecration. And then that evening, we're going to have a beautiful banquet that will take place at the local country club. This banquet is in celebration of our consecration. It's also being used as a fundraiser. It's being used as a fundraiser because we need to begin improving our physical campus. We need to begin improving our physical campus so that the physical campus matches the needs of the demographics of our community. Now, we have demographics from all over the place, from all over the globe, and at every age category. But our growing demographic here are young families. You know it because you come to church and you see all these young families with little kids. I think we might have broken a record around here for 40-day blessings over the last few years. And we need to have physically on-campus space for those young families and kids. We need a new first-class playground here at St. Basil's. We need something of a pavilion type of structure with basketball hoops that can retract. A, so that I can go tell my old stories about how good I supposedly was. <laughs> but B, so that our kids can be here gathered together, building their peer groups on our campus with other people from the same spiritual foundations. We're looking into a sports field where we can have soccer games for our kids outside. We're looking into all of these things because our families need it. Our families need St. Basil to step up to the plate and develop our campus in a way that serves them. Now you may say to yourself, well, I've got gray hair. Too bad that didn't happen 30 years ago when I was raising my kids. Well, you either do have grandkids or you will have grandkids, or you should look and say, thank God my spiritual family is now in a position to develop these things and I'm going to step up and do my best. And so a first spearheading of raising funds towards this capital project is going to take place at that banquet that will take place the evening of our consecration. And so I look forward to seeing a robust experience of support so that we can develop this campus the way that our families need it to be developed. This isn't out of desire. This is out of necessity. Your families, my family, and the families that are continuing to join us here at St. Basil's. That was pretty quick, right? Firing line, bang, bang, bang. With that being said, I also want to share that when you go into the hall for fellowship hour, we now have our consecration table set up, and it'll be there every Sunday leading up to our consecration. Well, there'll be materials for you to go, take some materials to be able to read, to learn more about the consecration, and also there'll be people there from our consecration committee uh, that can field any questions that you have, whether those questions be about the nature of the consecration, any of the events surrounding the consecration, how you can help, or even how you can get tickets to come to the banquet, okay? Obviously, we have sponsorship for tables, but there'll be individual ticket sales as well. And so I pray that the good Lord blesses all of our preparation. I know that he's going to bless the actual consecration. I hope that he blesses our preparation for the consecration so that you and I may responsibly participate in his grace on those days. Please come forward at this time to receive Andiderun and go about your day in peace. May the good Lord be with us always.